percent Republicans, so it's I'm, not like I'm Megan Lieberman, live in Tampa, Florida. We're watching a lot today. Hurricane Isaac is over New Orleans. Mitt Romney is speaking to the American Legion in Indiana. And everyone's awaiting Paul Ryan's moment tonight. I'm joined now by Jeff Selleny, who's watching it all. So, Jeff, let's start with the speeches from last night. I was watching in the press center on television. You were in the hall. Um, what was the reaction like? Because it felt kind of tepid on television. I think the reaction was the delegates were finally happy to get this underway. They've been cooling their heels really <laughs> um, throughout the storm on Monday. And then through the official business proceedings on Monday, the roll call vote, which is exciting in, no, in most cases when it's unanimous. But in this case, there was a bit of dissent. So I think um, once the speakers finally got underway in the primetime coverage, people were excited to see Ann Romney. It was clear it was her first speech to this uh, type of setting, her first speech on teleprompter. But I think she did what she um, set out to do by try and at it least like begin she was trying to do a lot of things, her. though, right? She was trying to do a lot it of things. It seemed like in there a was a speech. sort of speech to women, and then there was the kind of trying to humanize her husband part. Um, and that was kind of interesting in that it was actually very little kind of anecdote about Mitt Romney. There was a lot more kind of about her own life and, and sort of defenses of him, right? I think it's all pieced together. She was absolutely trying to target uh, a female audience, those uh, uh, swing women voters out there. And that is one of the central challenges of the Romney campaign is trying to close the gender gap a little bit. She spoke directly again and again again and again. She said, I love you women. I hear your voices. <laughs> and she was trying to do a relatability. She was trying to say, uh, because she trusts and respects and relies on on her husband, Amit Romney, of 42 years. They can as well. She didn't you know, give specific examples of how he fixed the clog sink, but I think a right. lot of anecdotes may have gotten um, uh, picked apart the next day. And because they aren't exactly like everyone and they are somewhat different but she was trying to um, step back a little bit and basically urge people to follow her lead and trust him yeah we have a clip that sort of reflects that he's a steadfast guy you, sh you should trust him let's listen to that you may not agree with Mitt's positions on issues or his politics by the way Massachusetts is only 13 percent Republican so it's not like it's a shock to me but <laughs> but let me say this to every American who is thinking about who should be our next president. No one will work harder. No one will care more. And no one will move heaven and earth like Mitt Romney to make this country a better place to live. So, Jeff, that did have kind of a little bit of a a defensive tone throughout some of the speech. That, that one was sort of just trying to put him out there, but there was a lot that was sort of, you know, our lives aren't perfect. You may not agree with us. We know what you think about us, but we're real people. We have a real marriage. Right. I'm not sure defensive as much as she was trying to say, look, you don't need to agree with him on everything. She didn't say it, but left unsaid, she probably doesn't agree with him on everything. I mean, she was not talking specific issues. Last night was not the time to talk about um, abortion rights, for example, or other right. things. But that was the sort of understated message um, and, and a variety of other things. that You can like the whole of Mitt Romney without necessarily liking all the individual parts. I was struck by that. And if you talk to other speakers, um, uh, I just talked with Senator Rubio a little bit ago today. He had a similar line. You don't have to like everything he stands for. So they're really trying to create this structure for people to, you know, get over the fact that they may not like 100 percent of him. Who does 100 who does or like 100 percent of everyone? just may not even but, really but, like him or love I, him all that much. I think much. some people uh, like him. But you know what? A vote by someone who wants to defeat President Obama is worth the exact same right. as, as a vote by someone who wants to elect Mitt Romney. And I think she was very genuine and sincere in that moment there when she basically says, you can count on him. He, 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 he'll do it for you. Right. It was a pretty interesting tonal change when we got to Chris Christie. You know, she started her speech out by saying, I want to talk to you about love. Right. And then basically right at the beginning of his speech, he was like, this is not about love, it's about respect. Right. And he comes charging onto the stage. There's a big New Jersey and he's right. clapping his hands. And I think the Tampa Bay Times uh, sort of uh, summed this up. It's about uh, uh, Ann Romney here, the headline. And then the Tampa Tribune is about Chris Christie. So hard truth, it was yeah. a little bit of, uh, of a split Mixed screen. Message, yeah. I mean, initially, she was supposed to be on Monday night in the program. Right. But that was a condensed because of network coverage. But um, I think what was most striking about Chris Christie, he was supposed to he was supposed to fire up the crowd a little bit he was the 
keynote speaker after all. Right. It, there was a little bit of a whiplash feeling, perhaps, you know, like you'd change the channel suddenly during the speeches here. But uh, another thing that was uh, striking was how much of Chris Christie's speech was about Chris Christie. There was, <laughs> and a reporter at Politico, I believe, counted the number of times he said the word "I," something like thirty-seven. Seven, he count, like he said Mitt Romney, Romney like right. seven times, <laughs> um, and he didn't. I think probably most striking was that it waited. He waited until really the latter part of the speech to talk about him at all. But look, this speech was vetted by the Romney campaign. This was not Chris Christie freelancing. So whatever their reasons were for doing this, this was a moment for Chris Christie. He has a lot of fans out there. Um, I think they'll be hearing that plenty have the from Christie Mitt Romney. Magic rub off on sure. Romney. He did talk about Republican ideas and Republican ideas being sort of stronger than Democratic ideas. So let's listen to a, a clip of that. There's never been a country to shy away from the truth. Our history shows that we stand up when it counts. And it's this quality that has defined America's character and our significance in the world. Now, I know this simple truth, and I am not afraid to say it. Our ideas are right for America, and their ideas have failed America. And that is what the crowd wants to hear here, right? It they want absolutely to hear, we, is. we are the ones who've got the ideas. I mean, for as important as getting to know Mitt Romney is, I mean, a whole a political convention is about red meat, and it is about sort of firing people up. And I think that uh, those few words from Chris Christie really um, were designed to motivate people. And that speech probably was more about the convention center here than the audience, the audience. out um, out in America. But you need Republicans and conservatives fired up there as well. So I would not be surprised if we hear him uh, saying that again and again and again. Look, there's been a lot of speculation about his own political intentions, his and own whether motivations. He was a, but going to be VP or right. not. And, and no question, though, if Mitt Romney does not not win in November. If President Obama is reelected, we are seeing throughout this week uh, an early competition, an early look at the at the rising stars of 2016. Chris Christie last night, Paul, Paul Ryan, Ryan tonight. tonight, of course. So Marco Rubio on Thursday. Exactly. So uh, and all the other other new governors. We had Nikki Haley. We'll see Susanna Martinez from New Mexico. So that's a subtext of a lot of these conversations. Speaking of moving on to tonight, one thing we can't forget about is there is Hurricane Isaac still out there. And it's been sort of the background music of obviously this entire event so far. And it's kind of waned in the coverage here because the convention did get underway, but it is sitting over New Orleans. If it really gets bad, it could overshadow what's happening here. And it did kind of overshadow it a little bit on cable last night because they didn't replay the convention on the cable channels, right? They, they, they went live to the, the hurricane coverage. Right. And for my spot in the convention hall, which is just behind us here, um, we have a television screen there. And we're getting an audience behind us of people watching the CNN hurricane coverage before the live network uh, primetime coverage. Finally, I had to shut the television off. <laughs> so I could get my work done. But people are really interested here in this hurricane, what's happening. Uh, they're following the, the uh, uh, reports of the uh, rain and things. So the campaign is still watching this. Convention's watching it very carefully here. But we'll see uh, uh, more charity work. So there's something on the screen here already. Text um, a certain number to the Red right. Cross I, to get Ryan's money. Right, Ryan's tweet, tweeted right. earlier. So we'll be seeing a lot of that. They are watching it. But they're hoping they can get through this evening. But Governor Romney was going to be in, in Indianapolis tonight. He's coming back to Tampa. His aides won't say if he'll be in this hall or not. They're still not sure if the whole convention will go through. So uh, I think they're going to have him here in front of people as much as possible. They have to be ready for all contingencies. They do. Um, so assuming things go off without a hitch, at least tonight, what are we looking for? Obviously a big night for, for Paul Ryan. It is his, uh, his biggest stage so far. Um, the country yet does not know Paul Ryan. I don't believe we're going to be hearing a lot about his Medicare plan, for example, right. his budget cutting plan. We're going to hear more about his personality, his wisdom, his strength, his smarts, his intellect. He's going to be standing up on this stage as a 42-year-old young man. Uh, and he, he looks young. And he does. He's he, very boyish. He is, though, very popular with this crowd. Right. So. Are they worried um, about that? Are well, they worried about it overshadowing Mitt Romney? He is such I think a fan favorite here. That's a here. very prescient thought. Uh, I can just see the, the commentary right now. The crowd reacted more <laughs> uh, in a more excited fashion for, for Paul, Paul Ryan, Ryan than Mitt Romney. Romney. But I think at the end, at the end of the day, it's a package deal. It's, most people here are just fine with that. But he also has to uh, put some meat on the bones, if you will. He'll talk a little bit about um, uh, domestic policy, perhaps touch on foreign policy. John McCain is also going to speak That's to the convention That's our other split screen tonight, tonight right? We it is, that. and he's going to say basically that the Republican Party still cares about <laughs> foreign policy and national security. Even if it's, we're not talking about it as much as we it, normally do. It's striking do. just eight years after 2004 when national security dominated everything. It's barely discussed here. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks, Megan.
Up next, we have another voter profile. Aaron Fetcher lives just down the road from here in Orlando. He's an inventor and won't vote for Obama for re-election, saying he doubts the president's ability to help entrepreneurs like himself. My name is Aaron Fector, and I'm an inventor. As a child, I would invent things all the time, uh, electronic control devices, uh, things to go on my bicycle, maybe some ideas to go with my television. But every part of this grill is an important, is important part of the invention, including the grate. For the last 35 years, inventor Aaron Fector has worked out of this warehouse in Orlando, Florida, just a few miles from Disney World. And we got real lucky one year when we just happened to meet Bob Brock and the folks from Showbiz Pizza Place because they needed our animation. In the early 1980s, he was a 20-something prodigy, the engineering brains behind a popular music show featuring animatronic animals called the Rock of Fire Explosion. I bet that pizza tastes good. The Rock of Fire explosion imploded when Showbiz Pizza merged with Chuck E. Cheese in the 1980s. Well, I hated Chuck E. Cheese. When they came together and when the executives said, hey, this is a money-making idea. We're going we're gonna to combine with Chuck E. Cheese. Aaron, how about manufacturing Chuck E. Cheese? I said, I would rather have a sharp fork stuck in my eye, sir. <laughs> no. Okay, here's Hitler. You know, here's, here's uh, Bin Laden. And um, this game is the Bin Laden Basher uh, that was fashioned after a game I invented in 1976, what was called Whack-A-Mole. But he and, continued uh, to invent with a small share of successes as well as some heartbreaking disappointments. So we are now in the room that I developed the anti-gravity freedom machine in. The only people that had email were the real techno geeks back in the 80s, but it wasn't for the masses. And what I was trying to do was to develop email for the masses. And that's what this machine was. You would touch the person's name on the screen when it came up, and it would automatically send that letter to the person using your phone line at home. And this was 1996, and the internet started kicking. And by 97, everybody had free email on the internet, and it put me out of the email machine business. So uh, maybe I was a little slow getting it out. I, I worked on it from 1981 to 1998. I've got so many ideas to, to follow up with that I don't have time to stop and cry over an idea not working. This is my newest invention. What we've really got is this gas. Like many small business owners, he is circumspect about President Obama's ability to help entrepreneurs like himself succeed in a challenging economy. Business-friendly politicians make more sense to me. I cannot support President Obama for his re-election. Now, I think he's cool. He sings his tail off. Boy, he does an Al Green that beats mine all to pieces. Mr. Obama has got plenty of soul. He's got plenty of talent. He should be on television. But he couldn't run a lemonade stand to save his life. While he has worked hard on numerous projects, Vector has not had a major success in the last two decades. And in 2007, several of his real estate investments went sour. He says he lost most of his money. But that has not stopped him. Uh, well, you have your depressed days where you think to yourself, my God, it took me so long to make that money, and now it's gone in a flash. I don't have to be rich. You know, as long as, if you can be who you are without having to put on airs, then you can survive being broke. I'm not poor, I'm just broke. Now let's check in with Ben Smith of BuzzFeed from our media center. Hey, Ben, how are things going down there? Hey Megan, good. Uh, good that well, there are there are no voters voters here, but other than that, it's uh. It's There's going not pretty many well. people in the hall here either. It's it's pretty early in the day. <laughs> the um yes, we were with all just just all media talking to each other, um, and and to occasional occasional Politico types. I'm joined here by um, by, by Rick Wilson, a conservative Republican consultant who has um, who you know I've known for years and years. I first met him at the 2004 convention, but he's become famous really as a as a as, as a Twitter voice. Um, saying in public things that I never quite thought, uh, that I was always shocked that he would let me quote him on. I'm your id. Yes, yeah, he, well, you're, he's your somebody's id, <laughs> not mine. Um, I don't know, Mitt Romney's. Um, 
But so, and, and you were, you, you sent to me in an email today that something that I thought was kind of su sort of surprised me, that this is the first convention you've been to where, where social media was in the DNA of the convention. Oh, I wondered what you meant by that. Absolutely. I mean, I, it, the, the thing that struck me was I walked onto the floor the other day and there was the hashtag underneath Romney Ryan. Right. It's fine. And it's something that, that has just become so ingrained in everything we do. Our cultural, you know, uh, constructs have become wired around social media. We can't all talk to each other on the phone every day. We can't all have a personal content every day. But there's this, 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 God did wax philosophic, this new sphere of, of, of information that everybody has access to. Do you to think now. it's like it's like coarsened the political conversation? I mean, you say very very blunt things on social media. You know, I think I think it has reduced the formality. The things that I thought you would just say to me once in a while, you'd let me quote you saying. Yeah. Now you're saying to your ninety thousand followers. Well, you no, know, not many. quite ninety thousand, but um, it, no, it, I think it has somewhat reduced some of the formality and the and the and the constructs that people used to. You know, my my my, my honorable friend is now screw this guy on Twitter, you know, <laughs> it, it, they, they, they've, they've, it's become a faster, more direct set uh -huh. of, 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 with less friction, so you end up with fewer polite bits of conversation so, than what, you once had. And what did that mean last night? What, did the, what, what happened last night around these, around, you know, the small speeches and the big speeches where you saw that popping out? Well, a couple things. I mean, you, you definitely saw the balkanized nature of Twitter last night with the Ann Romney speech going on, where Republicans felt like... Like this was a woman who was telling a personal story about the love of her husband and about her family and about you know the challenges that whether you're rich or poor every family faces. You know, a kid's fever doesn't care how much your net worth is. And so she's telling about her life as a mom, and a lot of folks on the right were reacting very positively to that. They felt like it was really connecting, and a lot of folks on the left were saying, "Oh well, she's a rich corporate wife, and she's she's a trophy wife, and all these things." That you know, it, it, ironically, that are that are more demeaning and sexist than anything you would ever hear out of a Republican. But it, I mean, well, not necessarily <laughs> ever. But it, uh, but what you saw was a very different set of you know you saw two balkanized right. communities, and those things are thrashed back and forth. And reporters, I think, ended up covering the story a little bit about you know, it's not just how the people in the hall react, and it's not just how the people in in the actual room react. Yeah, there's sort of a dynamic where whoever says like the most obnoxious thing on Twitter wins, yeah, right, or at least or get or loses or something. Yeah, I mean, there's there's got to be some Godwin's law thing on Twitter. We haven't quite come to what it is yet. Right. But, uh, where you, you know, can disqualify yourself right, by being so where you're basically no longer a serious person, right. uh, deserving of, of being in the conversation. But I think, I think you know, you saw that with 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 her last night. With Christie, a little less so. I mean, because the guy's just a big performer, and everybody kind of loves that stuff. And even even the Democrats He's too big for Twitter. Well, even can't, the can't fit him yeah, in there. Twitter is just like uh, the guy's just straight gangster. I mean, he's he's too big for Twitter. <laughs> But they love him, and and I think he got a good reaction on uh, you know. Yeah. On, the, I, I noticed that I, I, the, the liberals were less less vocal about Christie than they were about Ann Romney. And though I think we were talking before, I think the most interesting thing that happened around social media last night was Mia Love's speech. This yeah. white green, she's a she's a right. mayor of a small town in Utah mm -hmm. who's running for Congress out there. Right. Um, African American Mormon woman. Right. I think she probably will be the only only. only yeah, only one of those. That's a Venn diagram with very small overlap. Right, exactly. Exactly. I guess we're hearing some sound of her speech now. Okay. Um, but she, um, she, she was. I mean, she was really a star, even though her speech was not broadcast on the no. uh, on, on the networks. No. And but so. So what, how did that happen? That's what happened with Mia Love was twofold. First off, her biography and her character and who she is is really compelling, and people are fascinated by this woman because she defies every stereotype, left and right, mm -hmm. honestly. And this is a complicated, full, whole person, and she's fascinating to people. The speech yesterday, you know, look, she's young. It wasn't like this perfectly crafted rhetorical vehicle, but it was so genuine and yeah. so passionate. And people were watching it at streaming and that's they not, really responded to it. But that's not what raised her ninety three thousand dollars to What raised her ninety three thousand dollars was the fact that a lot of folks are, are on the sensitive, kind, diversity friendly left uh, referred to her as anti Tom. And Maybe not a lot. Not a lot, Maybe but one. you know what? There were quite a few. Right. There were quite a few. And 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 the problem with that is this is the kind of thing where if 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 one iota of racism is wrong, mm -hmm. if one perceived dog whistle on one side is wrong, it's always wrong. If we're going to play by these rules, Twitter's going to level the playing field. It's going to allow people who support her and who, 
who were offended by that to vote with their to vote with their PayPal link yeah. and support her. So raising it was fifty thousand dollars last night, and you said ninety three thousand. Yeah, I just checked with her guys. It was ninety three thousand dollars for an obscure congressional right, candidate. An obscure yeah. congressional candidate in a in, in a, a very seat, tough race. In a seat that's pretty tough. Right. In a seat that's pretty tough. I mean, they just gave her two weeks of TV. Thanks, guys. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, this is how it, because it reduces friction. Twitter and social media ends up with very quick developments like that. She probably didn't raise ninety three thousand dollars in the last two months. And, and boom. And, and but wasn't I mean, is this like really the best of politics? Is this sort of a, an outrage machine? Like this was like the single dumbest thing anybody said in the last twenty four hours on Twitter was to use this racial slur about Mia Love. And like that's actually the most important thing with real world consequences. You know what, I, I think you and I both live in a world where we get rewarded for being outrageous sometimes. Mm. And unfortunately or fortunately, it's just a different environment now. I mean, look, if this was 300 years ago, we would have a courtly bow before every meeting. But now it's you know a much more bare bones, bare knuckled world we live in and people are going to communicate effectively. And so we built this kind of Darwinian information ecosystem where you know you hope good ideas emerge, mm -hmm. but sometimes crazy ideas emerge. You don't have dysentery. Well, and th thanks, yeah, thanks. We'll call her or the play. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. And uh, <laughs> th thanks, Megan. Back over to you. Thanks, Ben. I'm joined now by Mark Leibovich, who's a piece in the Sunday's magazine about the joyless campaign of 2012. So, Mark, you and I have talked about this a lot this year, yeah. <laughs> which is that there just seem to be a lot of joy in campaign bill this season, does there? There, there really isn't, and I think it starts for with reporters or, or, or election officials. Or, yeah, well, when will lump reporters yeah. into this too? No, I mean, I think it starts with the candidates. I mean, these are two very, very serious people who don't really have the love of politics that you've seen in, in people running for president in the like past, Clinton, like a Bill Clinton or right. a Ronald Reagan, or even George Bush the first time around, or even maybe even Barack Obama the first time around. Right. Um, so I think that that starts, that starts with the them and and you, I think it sort of goes down from there. I think the combination of the times, the the, well, it's the a new rough media, moment. it's a rough moment. The uh, the fact that you know everything is so much faster now. And and look, I mean, it's just a very negative campaign. Now, I was very careful not to sort of dip into the lament about how this is the worst ever and how uh, you know how will we ever get civility back and and so forth. Right. I mean, I just think it goes deeper than that. And I just it was a very personal sort of look at more personal. And it was kind of that. nostalgic look at sort of the idea that there are people out there who do love politics, and it's kind of more right. fun to cover those people because they are into it. <laughs> right, and, and I think it's more than just politics and theater of it because it's it's more. Um, I mean, I actually, and this sounds maybe. I mean, a little weird, but I mean, I actually have been despairing quite a bit for the country. My daughters are getting older. They're starting to pay attention to this stuff. And, and one of the good things or, or sort of powerful things about living in Washington is that you want your kids to feel good about your leaders, no matter what and party And have a reverence for the whole process. And have a reverence for the whole process. And, and um, you know, there just does not seem to be the kind of sanctity to the process that there once was. Whether the, san whether the process was good or bad, it, it just it had certain rules and certain traditions. But, you know, there's also the obvious contrast to 2008 where there was so much excitement right. and there was all of these ways in which it was potentially history making and you know it was an open race so there was not an right. incumbent who was trying to slog it out and kind of regain hold on to office so there just was right. it is a contrast loser isn't it yeah no i mean i think the, the ghost of campaign past specifically singular so campaign yeah. past uh, does linger over this one somewhat particularly uh, over the obama campaign which had such like a messianic kind of feeling about it the last absolutely. time. Absolutely. And they they really don't even pretend to do that now. And that's sort of the message. I mean, I have gray hair now. This is a grinded out campaign. Uh, there's no Hillary. There's no Sarah Palin. Um, now look, I mean, you cannot compare one group to another group and every election is different. But I do think that there was such a transformative feeling to the last one. Uh, it would be hard to measure up no matter who was running this year. And Mitt Romney's sort of famously kind of awkward and uncomfortable and not happy right. to be out, not a happy warrior out on the trail. So right. you don't get the sort of sense of like fun and excitement from that campaign, which also in its own way has been running for five years anyway. It's been running for five years anyway. I mean, you could argue <laughs> that Mitt Romney's been running for president for far longer than, right. than, you know, five years or six years or whatever. So, yeah, no, Mitt Romney is a cerebral person. Barack Obama is a cerebral person. I mean, and that sort of, I mean, they obviously... And to the staffs too, though, right? Like there is a kind of... It, it is to somebody. I mean, I think it does start with the candidate. Um, I, I think that the staffs are, are so moneyed at this point. I think there are so many other moving parts like the super PACs, like the fact that everything just sort of burns off in the news cycle. I mean, just the Twitter wars. Um, and, you know, to sort of get to the media piece of this, I mean, there is an incredible anxiety and an incredible um, sort of treadmill quality to it that I haven't seen in the, in the past. I mean, at least even as recently as four years ago, there was more time to breathe. 
and uh, Twitter just came into to effect, uh, came into being a few months before the last election, and I think that's been a huge, huge difference. Yeah, the one time that there seems to be joy among the campaigns is when they're really going after each other and when they really get a gotcha moment, when they get to yeah. seize on the gaffe of the other campaign. That seems to be the big the big thrill. There, there is a relish there. <laughs> um, and, and the fact is, it's all very fleeting. I mean, I, I was up in Boston interviewing a bunch of Romney people when I was there, and I was sitting with Eric Fernstrom, the, the communications director, and he, his infamous moment on the campaign was the etch a sketch, sketch moment, quote, right, of right. course. And I, I literally had forgotten what it was that made him infamous like two months earlier. <laughs> it was like so many umbrages ago and right. so many outrages ago. So many ago gaps and, ago. Who, and who Ed, could keep and track Gillespie anymore? was there. And like, oh, he had that retroactive thing, but who remembers that? And, and in the moment, it seems like, oh, boy, this is a real game changer. And, I mean, it, just, it all does sort of burn away, and it does sort of make you somewhat jaded, I think. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Megan. Thursday night's convention schedule includes a mystery speaker in a prime slot. The only listed speakers for that night are Senator Marco Rubio and Mitt Romney himself. Speculation is swirling on Twitter. We're putting up some examples right now, but who do you think will be the third speaker? Who should it be? Tweet us with the hashtag RNC Mystery and tell us. We'll share some of our favorite responses this evening. And now a little fun with Christoph Niemann. He's been drawing social media from around the con convention to animate his illustrations. Okay, that's all for now. I'll be back this evening. But right now, op-ed columnist Frank Bruni is standing by with fellow columnist Ross Dow. That. I don't look at the camera, right? Thank you. Thank you, Megan. I am here with Ross. Hey, Frank, how are you? Good to <laughs> I, be here. I pause because sometimes I mispronounce your last name. Sometimes I mispronounce it, too. Right. One, my, one of my fellow columnists. And you had a, a terrific column in today's paper. Um, very interesting. About it, it, it pivoted off of Ann Romney's speech, but I think it was about bigger things. It was about the attempt that she was making and the Romney campaign makes to bridge the wealth class divide right. between them and other voters. How important is it that they, that they construct such a bridge? And if it is important, how do you do that? I mean, I think some kind of bridge is very important, right? Especially since so much of the focus of the Obama campaign has been on using Romney's wealth, his business record, and so on, to brand him as someone who's out of touch with ordinary Americans, who's a kind of Gordon Gecko figure, and so on. And I think if you watched Ann Romney's speech last night, you saw sort of two models of how the Romney campaign could go about answering that attack. On the one hand, you saw her trying to sort of emphasize the sort of ordinary side of the Romneys, right? The fact that they, you know, worked hard in their 20s and ate pasta and tuna fish and sort of lived like... And you felt that wasn't the best part of the I, speech. I just think there's no way to sell the idea that Mitt Romney, the son of George Romney, is in any way just like you or me. And I think the more effective half of the speech was the second half where 
Ann Romney sort of owned the fact that her husband comes from a privileged background and sort of presented him more as a kind of old-fashioned wasp aristocrat, the sort of person to whom much has been given, but who is given much in return, and who you can trust with the levers of government, in a sense. So the idea is, don't vote for Mitt Romney because he's the guy you want to have a beer with. Vote for him because he's been given a lot of responsibilities throughout his life, and family, professional, right. governmental, and so on, and he's fulfilled them. He's lived up to them. I think, as you, as you said in your column, he doesn't need to be a man of the people if he convinces voters that he's a man for the people. Right. I stole that line from the movie Gladiator, though, so, it, you know, you should take it, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Well, we all get our inspiration from Russell Crowe. I mean, are there examples in campaign campaigns past of politicians who've been in a situation similar to Romney's, where it's very hard for them to forge an easy connection with voters. They can't really say, I've lived like you, I know all your experiences, but they can convince voters nonetheless that, that they're the right people for the job. Well, I think if you look at the Bush family, right, the, both George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush, you see sort of different approaches to that problem, right? Where George H.W. Bush, clearly a very patrician figure, sort of labored ineffectively to, you know, brand himself as the kind of guy who liked to eat pork rinds and so on. Whereas his son was more effective in sort of presenting the con himself as having the common touch. I think Romney is closer to George H. W. Bush in sort of his personal affect and so on. And I think that means he shouldn't try too hard to, you know, act like an ordinary middle class American because he just clearly isn't. He has to own the patricianness in some sense and make it work for him instead. So when it comes to the, the keenly anticipated speech that he's going to make tomorrow night, he's today, um, I think by McKay Coppins for BuzzFeed, one of our convention partners, um, saying that they're going, there's going to be at least some discussion by Romney of his Mormon faith. Okay. And I actually think that that's a pretty smart move, because if, if you're looking for an aspect of Romney's life that sort of demonstrates a commitment to service over self-interest and so on, to being something other than a ruthless, hard-charging businessman, you'll find it in his record as a leader in the Mormon church. And for good or ill, you know, there are risks there, but I think trying to make that work for him, that image of somebody who's sort of you know, sort of stooping to serve, demonstrating a kind of noblesse oblige, I think that's the best way to approach this challenge. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll hear tomorrow night. We'll know soon enough we'll what's going to happen. We'll know soon enough. That's all for now. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you'll come back at 7 p.m. for the continuing live coverage of the Republican National Convention.